Hello, and welcome to the Liquidity Event. We are your hosts, AJ. And I'm Shane. This is episode 40, 42 being recorded on Wednesday, May 11th, 2022, airing on Friday, May... What is this Friday? 13th. <laughs> Gotta do that math there. It's Friday uh, the 13th. Friday the 13th. For us, it's a, a day for us witchy girls to celebrate. Are you going to celebrate the 13th? <laughs> is that uh, where you're going with this? I don't know. I just like, always get excited. In the Jewish faith, 13 is a lucky number, not an un- un- unlucky number. Is that true? Mm-hmm. I think. <laughs> Did you just make that <laughs> you just make No, I'm pretty sure. Facts. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I just have to believe whatever you say about Jewish culture. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> I grew up, there was like four Jews in Mississippi growing up and they were, <laughs> I don't think I met any of them. <laughs> not a big Jewish population down there. No, no, mm. not indeed. Uh, playing speaking catch up. of Mississippi, where you don't want to live ever, you are currently wow. traveling the Western Okay. That was <laughs> I was like, that's my segue. <laughs> uh, unnecessary back my segue. to Where, my homeland. What are you up to? What are you doing? What are you drinking? What are you up to? Unbelievable. <laughs> um, I'm sorry we couldn't all grow up in 90210, bro. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, I'm in Portland. Yeah, I uh, we have a retreat here next week. I drove up from LA before my drive back to New York City in two weeks, a little cross country. Um, I am enjoying it here. It's really beautiful. It's a beautiful city. Um, very first green, time? very wet. Yes. First time Oregon. First time for a lot of these states up here in the upper half of the country. If there was a peanut butter sandwich cut diagonally instead of horizontally, I have not been to the top half of that peanut butter sandwich of the United States. So Looking forward to seeing all this. I'm a little under the weather. I went sailing last night. I think it fucked me up. <laughs> I think it pushed me over the edge into a little bit of a cold. The sea sick you. <laughs> the you sea sick. was angry that day, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking uh, yeah. of the sea. What? Not being angry. Uh, I just finished <laughs> one of the best oh, books right. I read in a really long time. Uh, sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel, who... Uh, is an amazing writer of pandemics and science fiction. And this book, is, it's just, it's beautiful. It's beautifully written. It's cool. It's kind of about the pandemic. It's like, it feels very, now it's about time travel. Hi, highly recommend. Five five stars from AJ. Is this is sci-fi? Sci-fi, of course. Yeah, I don't read, <laughs> I read S1s and sci-fi. I don't read anything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you reading? <laughs> As one of my favorite favorite friends once said, well, I don't understand why people read anything except sci-fi. <laughs> like, yeah, it's yeah, insane. It's why, would you, why would you waste your time with novels about contemporary life? No, thank you. The memoirs. Why would anyone ever read a memoir? I am only reading <laughs> item descriptions in Elden Ring. I'm playing some video games while I'm sick. So, yeah, oh, that's fun. what I'm reading. Yeah, That's fun. Yeah. That's lovely. You're, that's not what you said the other day when you were making fun of my Xbox. Oh, <laughs> I was, I was repa- making fun of you. I was repairing my Xbox. I felt like a 12 year old. <laughs> I Sorry, like Jay, 12- I can't come to our executive meeting because I got to go to you break I fix to repair my Xbox. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I told you that in confidence. <laughs> you know and then I blew up your spot. <laughs> <laughs> yes i buckled like a child post-tax season uh mm-hmm. nostalgia but an xbox uh it's fun yeah video games are huge big industry not to be an out-of-touch politician but how much does an xbox cost about five hundred like... bucks okay cool that's yeah. what i thought i was yeah. gonna guess 399 plus you know eight percent inflation we're about at 500 since my last pegging of that price to 2003 <laughs> The word pegging is going to come up a lot today. <laughs> oh, <Uncle>. no. <laughs> <laughs> As I, oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay tuned, <laughs> listener. <laughs> this week on the podcast. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we do have some IPOs this week. We have 
two very similar IPOs. Yes, very odd uh, week for IPOs. We have two similar companies going public in a you know once barren IPO market. I mean, who's trying to IPO during one of the biggest sell downs uh, of the last ten years? Huge withdrawals happening. Uh, in the stock market, market is experiencing a, <laughs> they're not going up and to the right. <laughs> There's a, uh, Gen Z investors are experiencing the first time that stonks have ever gone down. So that's yeah. fun this week. But yeah, within that barren uh, IPO landscape, we have two electric vehicle companies going public at the same time. Not Rivian, not Tesla, obviously has been public a long time. Um, almost We'll talk private. about Rivian later, by the way. I have some yes. well, some strong words for them. A lot of EV in the news, electric vehicles, as opposed to ICE vehicles. Do you know what ICE stands for when it comes to regular vehicles? No. <laughs> you can come up with something fast enough. Insane no. clown. Yeah, that's what I Electric. Scared. That's what you're thinking. That's what I'm scared. <laughs> Insane clown brain. electric. Yeah. No, we no. just talk about ICP at least once a week. <laughs> uh, internal combustion engine is what okay. yep. yeah, 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 stands makes for sense. So more traditional vehicles. All right. So we've got Envirotech and Phoenix Motor. Uh, both filed to go public, aren't necessarily going public. We'll see what happens. But yeah, I just thought it was odd that in this barren market, we have two, we've seen a lot of biotech. So maybe this is not unusual, but we've seen like three or four tiny nano cap biotechs going public. But now we have two electric vehicle companies. Uh, Yeah, they're both hilariously unprofitable, right? Um, We can compare them side by side. Um, What do we have here? What's our... uh, Profit and loss. Yeah, we've got Phoenix Motor uh, is operating at a fourteen million dollar loss versus Envirotech, which is operating at a seven point seven million dollar loss. So, you know, it, what we have learned, well, what we'll talk about later with Rivian, is that it's very expensive to get an electric vehicle company off the ground. Right? You have the tech, you have the ideas, you need a cash infusion to get production going and open your first plant, and then actually get vehicles on the road. Uh, what's interesting about both these companies is that they're not um, they're not consumer products, right? These are not for these are not your cool Teslas or your slick Rivians for the tech forward outdoorsman or outdoors woman or outdoors person. These are <laughs> uh, shuttle buses and vans and like, you know commuter vehicles, trucks. These are this B two B, as you said earlier. Yeah, B two B two B electric vehicles. Yeah which uh, traditionally has less pricing pressure and, you know, as opposed to the retail consumer when, you know, your average Dick or Harry or Sally or whatever you is purchasing something, there is a limited amount of budget when businesses are more willing to to dr- drop dollars here. So I think these might be the, f- are these the first B2B electric vehicle companies out there? I don't know if there's anyone else pushing. I haven't seen them on the streets at all, but everyone's coming at the market cap of of Tesla, which has, you know, now has the market cap exceeding, I think, all other vehicles. I saw a post the other day about how it's worth. All oh, yeah, it's, than- it's yeah, it's it's encapsulated all the other ones. Uh, have you ever driven a Tesla? By the way, no, I can barely get into them. I, anytime I was, I was in California, the Uber would pull up with the Tesla. So <laughs> quick story. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> quick story. Uh, Teslas. I don't think all of them, but some of them have a mode called drag race i'm not making this up by the way it sounds like i made it up but i did not uh a mode called drag race so if you're in a very safe unpopulated location with lots of open road with no other cars ahead of you you can hit the drag race mode and you go from zero to 60 in literally two seconds or however fast it is and it is so fucking fun it's like riding space mountain and now i want to Tesla after years of shit <laughs> like Wait. honestly like like a roller it's like a roller coaster when did you do that? Uh, like three weeks ago at my my new friend's Tesla in, in California. You are such a <laughs> such a hater on Tesla that now <laughs> now that it feels like Space Mountain. But it has Space Mountain. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> As we don't know, Dis- AJ just got back from Disney World as well, so she's got <laughs> Space Mountain on the brain. God, such a- which I did ride and I almost killed myself on it because people with heart conditions are not supposed to ride Space Mountain. <laughs> you literally got on a roller coaster? That was a very bad Bro, judgment call on, on my part. You're supposed to check with me before you ride roller coasters. I need to <laughs> I know, know if I'm it. about to inherit half the company. <laughs> Jesus. 
It was a bit of a bad judgment call on my end. Anyway, Dear instead listener, of writing... AJ literally has an <laughs> iPhone-sized device on her heart to keep her alive. She should get too scared. <laughs> sincerely like i'm not allowed to scare her anymore because she could die <laughs> she's out here riding roller coasters without telling me i thought you so were at a bat totally mitzvah worth... with cinderella it wasn't a bat mitzvah and cinderella was there but i also read space mountain jesus anyways <sighs> i'm sorry i didn't tell you about you it. can't get a tesla i didn't know it had space mountain mode i thought it just had <laughs> like autonomous you can't crash this car chill like prius mode mm-mm, mm-mm. No, it's a it's a beast. It's like a race car. It's pretty. I cool. feel like a parent that just found out that you weren't going to football practice, but like fucking doing drugs under the bridge. What's going on? It was worth it. It was definitely worth it. Anyways, <laughs> by the way, that dumb, that's not a reference to any activities that have ever happened in my life. <laughs> I made that reference up. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, if you're listening, <laughs> I was definitely in football practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so two cool car companies, uh, B2B electric vehicles. I mean, that doesn't really get anyone too hot. They both have big losses. I don't know why they're going public the same week, but it is interesting that we're going to get access to this. Um, one of them is at doing $3 million. Yeah, they're only doing $3 they have million. Revenue. Dollars. Yeah. What are they selling, like merch or something? One's got $2 million. I mean, one of them has five employees. EnviroTech has five employees and Phoenix Motor has 55 I feel like, employees. Yeah. I feel like there's more to the story here. Like these are like spinoffs or there's something, something up here. Something is up here. Yeah, these tiny IPOs are always, you know, always interesting. I mean, Rivian IPO, they, when they IPO, they, what did they raise? 11 billion? I think it's going to come up 11 in our article later. Yeah, yeah let's, so. just, let's, just, let's just jump over to that because it's related. So yeah, so Rivian... Okay. Uh, Rivian was the largest IPO of 2021 and the sixth largest in history. They raised 11.9 billion, almost 12 billion dollars, uh, at their peak share price back in November of just just this past November, just when when we were riding high and we all thought the market was going up forever. Uh, it was trading at 172 dollars, and today it's trading around 20 dollars a share. Uh, so massive, massive upset there for. That's a sports term, right? Uh, massive upset for yeah. for Rivian. Yes. But what what's more interesting here are the other investors in Rivian, which were Amazon and Ford. Um, both had, I think, one, I forget, respectively, about a 10% stake in Rivian. And for the first time, so Amazon reported losses this quarter. And then a lot of that was due to Rivian, which is really interesting. And same with Ford. So they, they bet big on Rivian. Rivian appears to have crashed and burned uh, due to supply chain. They just couldn't get their shit together. They were probably overvalued. <laughs> With hindsight, we can say that they were overvalued. We did not think that back in November. Uh, and it's not not a good look. Uh, so yeah, they, they were way under-delivered on the number of vehicles they said they were going to produce. They're blaming the supply chain. They have a, pr- a plan and a path forward to create some value for shareholders and get some vehicles on the road. But we'll see what happens the rest of this year. Yeah, the punch bowl being pulled away means that cash has to come from somewhere. There's less future cash flows, thus lower valuations for these high flying growth companies that require cheap capital to maintain these valuations and continue to expand services. I mean, you're seeing it. I mean, if Brooklyn Five's investor like clients were an ETF, they are. (laughs) It would not be doing very well. (laughs) Investors are flocking to safety. Uh, dividend paying stocks and blue chips, old traditional Warren Buffett style investments. Um, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's, it's not a good month and not a good week, not a good few days in the stock market. You know, our, our clients are are for the most part, you know, they're scared. It's it's a scary time. You know, we're seeing stocks that are eighty percent off of their all time highs. You know, just six months ago, um, you know, we're looking at balance sheets where we haven't fully diversified yet, or we're partway through our diversification plan, meaning we're moving from holding 90% of our net worth in just one company to being 90% diversified in a bunch of other companies. We were planning on getting X price. We built a plan based on that. And now all of a sudden that value has been cut in half or been cut by three quarters. And it's it's not good. Mm. It's very scary, very scary mm-hmm. time. But we're going to mm-hmm. get through it, right? We're going to think about the long term. We're going to zoom out, have some perspective. That's all that we have. Is perspective in times like this? All we have is orange wine and perspective. 
Is that what we're, is that what our newsletter was to our clients? <laughs> hey, I know hey. your market, your portfolio is down. I know you've lost two commas of net worth, but uh, at least there's orange wine. No, it was that was not the tone of our newsletter. I'm <laughs> joking on our podcast. No, it's it's. I think we have to acknowledge that it's scary, right? We we can't discount. You know, we we talk all day as as financial planners. You know, we gotta you know, discount our, or ignore our emotions during these periods of volatility, but it's really hard. It's, it's scary right now. So like, I think we have to acknowledge those emotions, um, but really think long-term, think big, big picture and stick to the plan that hopefully we have in place with our financial planner. Yes. Yes. Um, one of the benefits of planning is when things change, having a third party objective person to help you navigate the, the rough tides, the rough choppy water that life inevitably throws at us in our 30s, 40s, 50s, etc. But that's enough high horsing for Brooklyn FI. We were talking about Warren Buffett here. Uh, he's back in the news with his dissing of Bitcoin. Uh, mm. I guess the Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholder meeting, a famous investor conference for folks that just give a damn about investing in general and investing commentary, want to know what the Oracle of Omaha has to say about things. And at the meeting this was the last week, he expanded on his um disapproval of bitcoin and like uh he spoke about it for about six minutes and he has this analogy or he talks about how uh, you know tldr he doesn't think that it produces anything he still thinks that it's a scam like he would invest in farmland he would invest in uh, apartments because farms produce food apartments produce housing bitcoin produces pollution uh, pollution <laughs> yeah so there's just just negative externalities um, I see where he's coming from here. He, he was also pretty uh, hesitant to invest in internet companies. Uh, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> uh, I mean, there was a bubble, of course, as a dot com bubble. But uh, if he invested in Amazon uh, back in the mid 90s, then he would have higher returns than he does have. Not that I need to question Berkshire's returns over the last 50, 60 years. But I do. I mean, how do you feel about this? I, I agree. Like, I am an optimist around cryptocurrency, but I don't understand use cases yet. And I'm still waiting for good use cases. Exactly. And I'm not yeah. digging for them either. Like I'm like, right. you got to prove it to me. Right. As, as a, as a Bitcoin skeptic, not a hater, I don't hate it. I believe in the technology. I, I'm like excited to see what blockchain technology provides as a good to society in the next two to 10 years. Like we're, we still haven't figured out, like the smart people are, you know, sit in the basements and in their parents' garages, like figuring out how blockchain technology and crypto and all of these alternative currencies are going to change the world. Right now, as an outsider, it feels like a bunch of dudes tweeting at each other about these coins that they've made up that are crashing and these poor teenagers or, you know, folks just out of college are like throwing their life savings into. Uh, and it, it feels like it's... Yeah, like it feels like it doesn't have value right now. But I, I do think there is long term value in in crypto. But you know, like but Buffett's like <laughs> I mean, I just looked this up. Buffett started investing in nineteen forty one. He was mm -hmm. eleven years old. Like the world's changed a little bit since nineteen forty one. So like his like if I were his age and of his position and I had my track record. I wouldn't be interested in like changing my whole business model and like my whole investing philosophy to make make way for this alternative asset. Like it doesn't surprise me that this is his take and it's okay for him to be skeptical because that's his investor base. His investor base are bogleheads. They believe in investing for the long term and looking at company balance sheets. There's no balance sheet of Bitcoin to look at. This is like well outside of his like <laughs> Well, technically it is. <laughs> sure, just there's a the blockchain. Giant balance sheet. <laughs> <laughs> it's just literally just a ledger. <laughs> so fair, careful. Fair, fair, fair. Don't but... don't add AJ if you heard that. <laughs> Please. Fair enough. But yeah. I this take does not surprise me, but I think it's it's necessary. Like we, we need critics. And I think that's a lot of the criticism of Bitcoin is that Bitcoin believers are do not do well with with criticism. It's it's all in or you're an idiot if you if you don't believe in it. Yeah, it continues to resemble a casino, in my opinion, uh, a big poker table where there are winners and losers. And the winners are those that uh, can bluff the best and or sell, uh, can buy the pot or can sell at the right time. But it doesn't feel like anyone is truly predicting value and investing in early and seeing a vision 
or there's going to be value because I have yet to see anything valuable pop out of the cryptocurrency space. Like, what what can I do now that I used to not be able to do thanks to cryptocurrency? I don't know. Please, someone, please tell you, me. Well, if you drive down, if you're driving in downtown Los Angeles, what you used to see as the Staples Center is now the horribly Crypto. named Crypto.com <laughs> arena. That's 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 a difference. That's the only difference that I've noticed. Maybe it's already happening. I just don't know that something has been enabled by NFTs or crypto. And well, that's what I'm, I mean. That's what, like I it's, we're so we are like the retail crypto investors, like so far outside of the think tanks and the brain trust that like I'm just waiting for them to show me what it can do, and that's where I'm at. You know what's <laughs> bonkers to me is this started in 2017. Like that was the first run up when Bitcoin went through the roof and there was a huge spike in like November, December of the price of Ripple, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and then the crash. So like, it's been five years since, I don't know, Bitcoin became a thing, like to the general population when our clients in their 60s started showing up with Bitcoin in their portfolios and were like, oh shit, like boomers have Bitcoin now. Oh shit, I gotta pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's like your mom's on Facebook now. Like everyone remembers like the first time that your parents enjoyed a social media platform, you're like, okay, time oh, to take no. down all like the drunken posts of me having a good time with my friends. Like that happened in 2017. And I private, still, no, private, private. <laughs> right. Yeah. Move to Snapchat, <laughs> move to Instagram, move to TikTok. Yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's, it's too volatile. Like this is not, investing should not make your stomach drop out. Right. Speaking of which, I mean, <laughs> what? You disagree? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, high risk investing comes with high returns. But um, what I mean, just Bitcoin just has had not it's Bitcoin is not stocks, like there's no value popping out of it. So first of all, I don't want to compare it like that where risk equals reward, like we've got the data for the past 100 years on high volatility generally is required for high return over the long term in the stock market. But I don't like to compare Bitcoin to stocks. Because again, there's no dividends from crypto. There's no shares right, like, in company profits. There's no profits from coins. It's just literally betting. The on only currency. profits are are You're betting the, that someone else will buy it from you in the future. Well, or the Coinbase who are just charging fees because this technology is so new. It's like, how do you get something off of the ledger or the balance sheet? Like, how do you get that out and into a currency that you can use to buy things and to create value or to a mass value. So like those are the people that are winning in the crypto space are those that can make money off of the... The picks and shovels, so to speak. Yeah. The people that maintain, yeah. The people that sell yeah. the, the jeans I mean, to the gold miners. Yeah, exactly. You know, the... The, stress. the uh, Speaking of like volatility, you know, today we saw a stable coin, which is a hilarious name for something that all Good of a sudden branding. is unstable. Yeah. <laughs> Stablecoin UST, which is supposed to be pegged to the US dollar. So it's supposed to be around a dollar in in USD terms, uh, fell. It had a dramatic fall in its uh, share price or price from a dollar to around 30 cents today. It came back up by the end of the day. But it's like, what? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're going around saying like, this is a stable coin. This is my this is the bank account of the crypto world. And this coin crashed. Like the if the US dollar crashed, we would have panic in the streets. Like we can't have our entire economy built on something that's going to crash 70% in one day. You know, then we're, we're like, you know, it's like, <laughs> we don't see that kind of economic like disaster. Like we haven't seen that since like the second world war. Like it's crazy. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't want to overblow this, this, this crash too much because this particular stable coin, this is, I learned this today. I did not know this is an algorithmic stable coin, meaning okay. mm. that I'm not going to try to explain this, but Acquiring. yeah, it's just, it's all about digesting equations being run all the time to try to like mimic this value. Whereas the other stable coins are just literally pegged to the dollar. And this particular one that crashed and lost all this value as of today only had about 8 billion in market cap, whereas the bigger coins had 81 billion and 40 billion. So it's a, it's a small portion of the market, but the internet was making a big deal out of it because people love to see people fail. And today, uh, UST, the stable coin, uh, had a massive fail. 
You have this Twitter uh, rant oh, here that God. you wanted to talk about, but the word peg is used too often for me to feel too comfortable reading this. I stopped. Oh, is that what it first, was? Okay. Like the, yeah, the fifth I mean, reference is, to peg. Yeah, I mean, honestly, listener, I learned this is a new world for me today. This world of uh, algorithmic stable coins. I, I did not know that was a thing, honestly. Um, I also learned that, what was it? Magic Internet Money is the name of an actual stable coin that has a couple billion... Uh, <laughs> in in holders of that particular currency or or crypto or whatever uh so yeah the, the guy who started this whole terra community which is behind the stable the stable coin that crashed today goes on this like 50 tweet rant and it literally just seems like gibberish to me like i was like trying to follow this and i'm like i don't know what you're talking about i guess he's talking about the algorithms and how we have to like slow them down or turn them back on and his last tweet is Terra's return to form will be a sight to behold. We're here to stay and we're going to keep making noise. That sounds like someone who's about to like disappear and go live in the Cayman Islands <laughs> forever. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, the guy that surely owns at least 1% of a market cap company, like I can't even call it a coin. It's worth $8 billion. So he's worth at least $80 million. And related to this coin, right? I'm assuming he owns at least 1% of something he invented. Um, every 1% is, you know, so uh, did I do the math right? 800, yeah, 8 billion. So uh, yeah, so no shit. He's like trying to buoy the price of this coin that just lost 50% of its value over the course of a few weeks due to like its wacky algor- a day. algorithmic trade. A day. Oh, was it one day? It was mm. one day. Yeah. And that's that's mm. the issue. I not don't, a casino. I don't wanna... It's definitely not a casino. And you definitely don't understand AJ, what cryptocurrency is, so you don't deserve to participate in this community exactly. Exactly. of people going to the moon. So thank you. Moving on to the next topic, please. You don't get it. Small brain women. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> and that is when Shane <laughs> got canceled. Mic drop. Mic drop. Uh, oh, Mike is... For the record, that was a joke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I'm... I'm I am skeptical of crypto, but I actually do believe in it. I just, I, yeah, I don't understand it. And it's not a part of my current portfolio strategy because I, yeah, I, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I understand it's That's effect enough. on the world. I'm just excited for it to see where it goes. You're cutting yeah. me off. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, we've talked about it a lot in crypto. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's talk about something cool. The, let's talk about the Biden uh, or the Democratic oh my God. internet. I'm so excited to plan. talk about this. Yeah. Okay. So the trillion dollar infrastructure package last year included this little line of of law where uh, the government will subsidize your high speed internet. So previously, a lot of folks in rural communities or cities uh, where you know they didn't actually have high speed internet or it was too expensive, uh, now the government will subsidize their monthly internet bills. So I have nothing snarky or bad to say about this. Uh, this is awesome. You know, it's it's gonna be it's good. There's gonna be bureaucracy. It's like they'll cover most of it, but then when you like have to prove your certain income, you get a rebate. Like it's not gonna just be like, hey, uh, what is it? It's 48 million households will be able to access this. That's like significant impact. It's not like you show up supposedly. and you're like, I'm here. Supposedly, so, I don't. Yeah, I don't see the details on like what level. Oh, you need to be at the 200 percent of the poverty line or lower. So mm-hmm. you have to be pretty pretty poor. Yep. Um, to have access to this. And it costs, if you're at that poverty line or below that level of income, you Zero. pay 30 I thought you paid $30. Well, so you pay $30, but then there's another subsidy that you can get back through a rebate. So it, it it's going to be like a little bit oh, of like totally, hoops yeah. to if jump you make through less to actually than 200% get it. of the poverty line, you're definitely great at paperwork and bureaucracy. Like that's right. definitely going <laughs> to. Right. So, so my, my, I'm so excited about this. Like, but the, the con, if I see any, is just the, the infrastructure and and actually getting this to work. Yeah, no, I think it's awesome. I think it's a classic example of the government trying to uh, help or the democratic government of liberals trying to uh, level the playing field a bit by offering subsidies to low income folks, allow them to bootstrap up out of the digital gap, the digital divide. I think that the internet is almost a form of literature or it's a, a language that you need to learn. Um, and not having access to speak that language is going to handicap people for the rest of their lives. It's like literacy. So I think that we're boosting digital literacy here, which is awesome. Some of the threats I see are classic 
paperwork, just like you were saying, like, yeah, you get a subsidy, like they're going to be working with AT&T, Verizon, et cetera, is going yeah, to be involved. Like... <laughs> so imagine three years from now, you your bill is $30 a month until the other party comes in and cancels these subsidies, or you start to make more money than you used to. And your bill goes from 30 to a hundred dollars. You don't notice you're still paying 30, six months go by. Now you owe fucking AT&T or Verizon or Comcast, like $600. You weren't paying attention because you're not great at paperwork because you're a low income earner. And suddenly your credit gets or you move. even further destroyed <laughs> or you move. Yeah. Classic. So yeah, that, those are some of the threats. Um, going to be tough to administer this effectively. It's like student loans, like waiting for this to be bungled, but you got to do something. We got to get high speed internet to the rural low income earners somehow. Yeah. I so mean, the wide, the wide eyed, it. the wide eyed sophomore college student at the liberal arts school in me is saying, this is amazing. You know, Harvard puts like all of its one on one courses online for free. So imagine you're mm. you don't have access to great teachers in your town just because of geography and your limitations. And maybe your parents didn't graduate high school, so they can't teach you and open your eyes to the world. And all of a sudden you're taking like computer science 101, you know, at Harvard, like that's fucking cool. I'm really excited about this. Yeah. I hope we get a Bill Gates out of this initiative. I hope we get 10 Bill Gates mm, out of this initiative. I hope we get like early Bill Gates. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know, early she... Bill Gates was even nastier than like modern right, Bill right, Gates. <laughs> right. <but> they, uh... <laughs> yeah. I mean, no I one can be. I, I mean, yeah. only... <laughs> which one's worse? Like, mild sexual assault modern bill gates or i'm trying to destroy every other competitor that yeah, maybe has monopoly. an idea similar to <laughs> yeah which one is worse monopolistic bill gates or hand on the lower back bill gates i don't know hmm. but hmm. we're almost done with malaria he almost killed malaria so oh he did oh the, the the bill and melinda gates foundation yeah That's they their, problems. that was their yeah yeah and trying to get rid of malaria trying to cut down on Oh, hard to say. Hard to say. It contains multitudes, that fella, for sure. Um, speaking of multitudes, um, you have this thing about Neopets. So you never played Neopets? <laughs> what a transition. Okay, so Neopets, for those who are not in the know, was this... I don't even know how to describe it. Like a, a sort of Pokemon-like Tamagotchi. Universe. Are they not Tamagotchis? Like what's... Sort of like Tamagotchis, but it was this whole universe. And it was... I When 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 I first heard about Bitcoin, whatever, a couple, like a long time ago, I was like, oh, that's like Neocoins in the Neopets land because you need to... You have to have people doing something to basically wasting time or in Bitcoin's case, like generating energy from running algorithms or running programs in... Neopets world, you had to play these games. You would play a game called Merca Chase, which was basically a snake, and you would generate this these coins and you could actually get real stuff. So Neopets is Bitcoin. Anyway, there's an article that I didn't even know was still a thing. This is, I mean, I literally, literally played this in like eighth grade. This is like internet early, early, early days. Like I was a child when I played this. And now I guess they're still around, which is news to me. All right, land the plane. <laughs> What's going on here? Fuck off. Stop <laughs> cutting me off. <laughs> I'm right. having a try. I think you just talked about your fucking Xbox for like the first 20 ah. minutes of the show. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, right. now they're getting into NFTs and, ever and the fans of Neopets who are still around apparently are upset. <laughs> that's all <laughs> that's the that's the end of the story <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> wait so, so okay so hey now neopets are issuing nfts and fans are neopets, upset about yes they're 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 selling the ip of neopets so people can make their own nfts and they're very upset how many people care well, Including at the you? height that the height of their <laughs> popularity, there were over 25 million users, over 80% of them being mar minors. I think the height of the popularity was probably in 2003, but here we are. <laughs> so 20 years ago. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you're welcome, folks. listener. You're, you're welcome. Thanks for sticking around for the deep cuts. <laughs> I'll see you on the Merca Chase battle. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. It does remind me for some reason of the photo of the the, the couple divorcing uh, in like the mid 90s that have all the beanie babies out on the Yeah. Oh, my God. The in, the, like, in the courtroom. That's the best. That is that is the, incredible. That should be in the Smithsonian. Image. Yeah, right? it probably is. Yeah. 
Like you get Tabasco, but I get the princess die. Well, die. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I get the dolphin flashed with the wrong tag backwards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, speaking of obscure media, uh, <laughs> <laughs> You have, <laughs> what is this? I mean, I didn't, I By the way, I did not find any of these articles. All these articles magically filtered into my internet universe today okay. via my inbox. And via <laughs> the algos. I gotcha. Uh, pro tip, do you subscribe to the USPS notifications for mail that you get? That's how I found out about yes, this next thing. actually, yeah. yeah those they, are great. You get an email every day of all the mail that's coming to you. So you're going to be like, oh, I'm getting a huge pile of junk mail. Or like, oh, that's my new... JetBlue rewards credit card that I've been waiting for. There's nothing I need more in my life than more emails, especially <laughs> redundant mail. ones about stuff I'm going <laughs> to get physically. <laughs> I definitely need more <laughs> emails <laughs> confirming physical mail <laughs> that I'm going to immediately throw away. But fair yeah, enough, go on, enough, go on. <laughs> But what about you? You're like a nomad. So don't you want to uh, whatever? It doesn't matter. Anyway, did you know this is uh, this is also a story going nowhere, listeners. So we're also way over time. So if you want to tune out now, be my guest. But I'm here to tell you about the USPS official podcast. Fuck it. This one's going to be 90 minutes long, <laughs> which I did not know was a thing. Uh, That's yeah. What do you think they talk about? <laughs> Routes? No, I looked. I looked it up. They talked Dogs? about like secure security, mail fraud, the ten year plan, the the reason why they're doing gas mail trucks and not electric vehicles, which is like a whole outcry last week. If I haven't listened, but it exists. Well, I mean, the U.S. Postal Service. I mean, we have a podcast, and our company does a few million in revenue. The U.S. Postal Service surely does billions of like. If it was an independent company, it would do billions of dollars of revenue, right? Like, in my, I don't have the government budget here, and they, I know that it loses money. But it, it's a service that we all pay for. It's supposed to lose money, but uh, what do you? Okay, so what? What's the revenue of the U.S. Postal Service? Yes, what do I it's think bil- that it, it is? is billions. Yes, I'm gonna go with a uh, hundred billion. Seventy-seven billion. That was pretty close. Pretty close. Pretty close. Give or take of twenty-five billion. <laughs> well. <laughs> What's a 20, 23 What's billion amongst billion? your fellow citizen? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, of course, they have a podcast where they talk about, you know, 77. I mean, my aunt was a postal worker. Aunt, aunt Peg, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Throwback joke to the pegging earlier reference in the show. Oh, that's so interesting because I emailed my one of my favorite English professors is named Peg. And I emailed right. her today. So today's right. Peg Day. It's Peg Day. And it's also Leg Day. Leg Day. <laughs> Today is leg day. Today is definitely leg day. Have you been outside? Oh, you're in Portland. <laughs> Portland leg day. Not so good. <laughs> mm, Portland peg day. Anyways. All right. We're just we're just shooting the shit now. Shall we keep going? I mean, we're already over. Oh, yeah. Let's keep going. <laughs> For our listeners that <laughs> don't know, bring it we, home. <laughs> we get charged extra by our podcast producer if we go over 30 minutes. So, <laughs> so fuck it. We're already over. Let's talk about Joe Biden's uh, tax returns came out. Uh, he filed them on April 12th, I want to say, April 13th, just before the deadline. Self-filed? Self-prepared? No. no. Yeah, what if they were? What if it was like turbo <laughs> tax? <laughs> That'd be so ill if, if Joe's like on the computer, like, oh, shit, I got to do my taxes. J- Jill, 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 get in here. Jill, I need the 1099 from Chase. For the 50th <laughs> time, Jill, I need your W-2. <laughs> <laughs> don't you and your husband have like a big it's like your biggest contentious thing oh, is your taxes yeah. Nabil and I have the best great relationship and then every tax time it's like a nightmare always a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> mostly because of you but other than Shut <laughs> speaking up. of which as my accountant I would like you to list president as my occupation on my 1040 I'm on extension so it's not too late to fix it yeah well only if I get to be listed as second gentleman on my tax return, <laughs> which is the coolest official title. That's yeah, that's uh, Kamala Harris's husband. He's the first official gentleman of the White House, and he is listed as the second gentleman, <laughs> which is so, so cool. Who do you think Kamala's first gentleman is? <laughs> Tilda Swinton throwback joke. She keeps two. What? I lost you there. <laughs> well, I mean, she's. You think she's got? Two gen- All right. It's just a funny title. Capital S, oh, no, second I, I gentleman. Yeah, 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 got it. 
Uh, anyway, yeah, he's listed as president. It's his occupation. They have income of about 600000 uh, About 370 k of their income is his W-2 as the president. She makes 70 k at the Northern Virginia Community College. She's a doctor, uh, as the Republicans made a big huffle puff about when she referenced herself as doctor. And like they were like, you're not a medical doctor. What if you're... <laughs> Okay, guys. I have a doctorate. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> let me be clear. Uh, most of their income comes through two S corporations, which I find very interesting when uh, politicians have S corporations. It's uh, a traditionally a risky thing to have uh, on your taxes ever since. I forget what presidential candidate uh, got into a lot of trouble. He was a doctor in like the year 2004. 2004 uh, was running and he had an S corporation to avoid um, Social Security and Medicare taxes. So tax avoidance are not heavily uh, favored amongst politicians, uh, at least prior Disagree. to 2016. <laughs> <laughs> when things used to matter, you could get in trouble for having S corporations. Doesn't matter anymore, apparently. Uh, they're both drawing from Social Security. They have about $50,000 of Social Security because they are old AF. Uh, they haven't paid their house off yet, which I find very interesting. They wrote off mortgage interest. So yeah. your own president, y'all, doesn't own his house. Uh, outright All right. mortgage yeah. interest. Uh, and they contributed about $17,000 to charity. It's very interesting how a tax return tells a narrative about your life, about what you're up to every year. And I read them like books, little essays about your little name, your little social security number. Your you little, wanted your... to be an English major so badly. <laughs> mm, c- couldn't afford it. I just wanted to get out of Mississippi. <laughs> so here we are. Good at taxes. Shall we continue? Do you have anything no, to say about I'm, I'm done. I'm out. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This has been... Oh, God. I can't even do the outro. You, this has been the, the liquidity event. Oh, Shane's dying. Shane has COVID. Oh, yeah, yeah. This has been the liquidity not. event. Now we're not rushed at all. I'm going to take my time. Okay. You can you can email us at liquidity events at brooklynfi.com. I check that email directly. We have a Slack channel, so your message will appear right before both of our eyes. Thank you for those who have reached out to us. You can leave us a voicemail as well. We'll play it on the air. Uh, show notes for this episode can be found at brooklynfi.com slash episode 42. Thanks for sticking with us for 15 extra minutes. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.